Dawn Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. On Story, presented by Austin Film Festival. A look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and filmmakers. This week's On Story, in the name of the father and my left foot writer-director, Jim Sheridan. I think my level of kind of analysis of how a movie plays is overdeveloped to the level of whoredom. You know what I mean? Because I've got to sell my goods in a society that doesn't know a, what the guys are talking about, B, their accent. And 90% of what makes a movie commercial, 90% is that the audience have to believe that's me. That could be me. In this episode, Jim Sheridan discusses creating award-winning films that draw upon his close relationship with his family. I didn't really plan for my left foot. I was just in the theater since I was young, about 16, 17, you know? Well, I just used to watch the, the movies and try and figure out how they were written. I, I, I suppose it's an eatable story, Christy Brown, you know? It's like, uh, it's not that I'm on one narrative all the time, but sometimes big narratives open up. You know, it's like a, you know, a tunnel or a fiber delivery system with, to your brain, like that eatable story is very, very deep in human nature. Um, and the variations of it always seem to me to reveal uh, how a society functions. And you know, Ireland was like, he's kind of disabled on the edge guy who can't function. And if you read the original book, it's viciously anti his father, which I didn't think could work, so I made the father nicer. Jesus suffering Christ. He's a brown. He's a brown, all right. But that story I just think came about, it's just a coincidence that I got a chance to make the movie I should have made first. Mm -hmm. Like Paul Greengrass, the movie he should have made. You make it first very often, Scorsese, nearly first, I think, you know. It's just something that happens, you know? It's like the way the, the brain is organized. There's a sniper! There's a sniper! He's up there! You can't get a bead on him. Shoot him before he kills us! I learned a lesson from my left foot. And what happened was, somebody was asking about, you know, having arguments with actors and um, or talking to them or how you get them to do what you, you want. And yeah, you know, myself and Daniel had a few arguments, not arguments, but you know, like whatever. And then he, I realized how strong and poetic he was, you know, and how tough. And so I was always a little bit afraid of 
touching the wrong nerve, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the movie got made, and it was go going out, and Harvey came involved in distributing it. And, uh, like, he came up to me one day, and he said, the, 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 the movie, don't you have the, 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 the language yet? The, 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 <laughs> Well, Harvey, he's all, oh, yeah, we're talking, can you can't can understand him. And I'm like, wow. I can't understand a word he's saying to me, and he said to me. So uh, he, he had this list of sentences or words that couldn't be heard in the movie, you know? And I was immediately in terror at telling Daniel, because I knew he'd go, <laughs> like betrayal, corporate, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so I was just thinking, is he right, Harvey, you know? Or, so I do what I always did, which is I, I, I go to the audience, you know, I actually try and check it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went, so this was before previews, right? Nobody had ever done previews. Oh. And I, I sat behind the audience and there was a couple. And I realized after a few moments that Basically, they had a problem with the one word. <laughs> what do you say? Maybe. <laughs> you know, tiny things where you didn't have warning that you had to listen. You know? So if, if somebody would say, um, yeah, yeah, maybe, you know, you'd get it. But if it's just maybe, no, it's gone. <laughs> and if in the first 10 minutes of a movie they miss either through indistinct enunciation or accents that are too heavy, which brings accents into a new dimension, because everybody thinks accents are accents, mm -hmm. and all these enunciations are enunciations, and they're power structures. They're sometimes the way people talk is they don't want to be understood, you know, because they're afraid of the power. Or, you know, there's an awful lot goes on in language. like. In England, in the military, they would say, oh, I, I, if, you, your shoes are smart today, which means get them cleaned. But in America, they just say, thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, they don't get the irony and sarcasm. Uh -huh. So it, they don't get tone in the US. I wrote down everything that people didn't understand throughout the entire movie at a couple of screenings. Mm -hmm. And I went to Daniel and I said to him, uh, Daniel, there's a few things that have a list of, uh, you know, there's a few things the audience don't understand. Mm. We'd have to post sync it. Mm. Uh, and he said, who gave you that list? I said, well, I said, Harvey gave me this list. There's eight sentences on it, but this is my list and there's 48. <laughs> you just have to create in a foreign movie or in a movie that's particular in accents, don't have them. Don't say much in the first 10 minutes. And that's good advice on a date as well. <laughs>
you went through these this series of very hard emotional films, and and certainly that trilogy is was opening up, I think, um, a world that really probably people in America were not aware of, uh, as you pointed out. But then you moved into some like like into the West was a completely different film, which is incredibly beautiful and and emotive, but in a different way. I mean, how did that happen? How did I, you know, like, that's a very interesting thing where people say, um, I, the way my head works is very odd. We, we pointed you know, that out. You know. <laughs> so when you ask me a question, I kind of go, go to one answer, and I, I, I then switch to the other one. And it's either my mom or my dad, you know what I mean? <laughs> so my mom is into the West. That was about her. Whether I knew it entirely then, I, I did. Whether she knew it, I think so. But I remember sitting at a play with my mom and dad, and it was called uh, Mobile Homes. So I had written this, and my dad was in it, and when they went, and he wasn't too nice of a guy in it, you know, and when we went, when I, they watched the play, my mother was saying, that's you, that's you, you know? <laughs> And then I realized kind of it'd be hard to sit there if it was you. And, and my mother, my mother's mother had died giving birth to my mother. She was the youngest of like 11 kids in, in the country. And her father was out cutting the hay or something. It was always the image in my head. And he, he kept refusing to come in saying she'd be okay if she died. So in the movie, it's about, that's what Into the West is about. Turn it on, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay, Tina Nose? Tina Nose, what is it? Stone. That's the day that mommy died. But I think I added that as we went along. You know, I think what happened was I realized, you know, this needs to go further. The the energy in it is like my mom, you know, it's the it's basically the heart. The mother is reincarnated in the horse, you know. And uh the father is in uh in in the name of the Father. And I, there's two personal stories that might show how insane I am. <laughs> um, or how the difference, I don't see much difference between film and reality. When I did In the Name of the Father, for instance, uh, that was done because of my dad was always the bad guy in the movie. So I hit upon the idea of doing a movie about a good father. <laughs> They're only young. Give him a chance. We were just trying to scare some sense into him. He was stealing that again. He ran through one of our houses and started all this. Did you start all this? Here, he'll never survive in this town. Never. This is the last time. <coughs> you two blow. And Danny, it's the last time. It's still for you, Connor. But I hadn't got the movie. I hadn't got the subject matter in my head. And then I started investigating Irish literature. And I couldn't find a good father for 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> what happened with my own experience of that was just making my dad happy every day, saying, I'm going to make a, good mo a movie about a good dad. And he was totally happy. <laughs> and, when, and I got great fun out of saying that to him, you know? And then, and, and I realize now, there's a wish fulfillment in every child to treat their father like a child. You know what I mean? Like to be in control, be the one in power. So when I made the movie and it was like finished in the cinema, you know, I said, my left foot was my mother, this is my dad, and here he is. <laughs> and he was really happy to come up on stage, you know. And I'm not sure what my mother was thinking, um, but he hugged me, and it was in a thousand seat cinema, the only one in Dublin, and he, he hugged me, and in this ear, he said, I love you. And I went, what's that? 
wow. And I pushed him back to look in his eyes, you know what I mean? And everybody was clapping. And Pete Postre, who played him in the Pay the Father, thought it was the most emotional thing he'd ever seen. And, but they didn't know what had happened. Right, but they maybe could still see it. And he died two weeks later. So when my mother was dying, I got a, a video recorder. Uh -huh. And I would go into the hospital and I would start recording her and say, oh, I was just putting something on tape here, because I knew she liked acting. Uh -huh. And I really think secretly she wanted to be an actor. Uh -huh. And she never revealed that. But when I put her on screen, she was she blew everybody away. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because she didn't know how to act. She only knew how to be. And so she, there was no distance between herself and what she was saying. And so she had this terminal thing. And, uh, I had the camera, and I knew that every day I had the camera, she felt, she felt a little bit more special, I don't know, whatever. You're giving a chance to somebody to be immortal for a minute. You know what I mean? For to be recorded, to be recognized, to be alive. One of my brothers, Peter, who's kind of a great artist, and he, he's a writer, and he had written a book that my mother had a problem with, and I kept telling them to come back. He was in America doing a book tour, and I said, he said, I'll be back next week. I said, she'll be gaga next week. So. Then two days later, I saw him and I realized I didn't have a charge on the video camera. Uh -huh. So I plugged it in the wall and stopped him and said, oh, how's it going in America? And he was like, good. And I said, in San Francisco, how's that? And the way families are, he said, are you stopping me going in to see my mother? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> so I realized that that's the charge I need. I pulled it out of the wall and I walked in ahead of him into the room. So I just went wide, and my mother said, and I never ever in my life heard her saying, ah, Pete, Pete, because she called him Peter, and my dad was Peter, so he was little Peter, which wasn't a good position for him to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So sometimes you used to call him Peter Martin. And my, one of my friends said, whenever you want the bad character in a movie, all you have to do is put the character Peter in. And I thought it was my brother, but I realized when I made my left foot, it was my father. Isn't that weird? So my mother said, pee pee, you know, and oh, whatever. And I love the book, and there's no problem with the book, and you know I love you. And, and then, and when I told this to Peter's friend, he said he thought I was the maddest person ever. I said from behind the camera, not as much as you love me, ma. <laughs> right. Because I was the eldest and spoiled, and everybody knew I was spoiled. So my, mo my mother started spe a speech, and I just zoomed in on her, got a close-up. And I'm saying got a close-up. This was the last thing she was going to say, logical. So how can you, like, how can you be that dispassionate behind the camera? So I realized that the camera gives you the ability to be invisible and not exist. Um, so she said, you know, oh, no, I loved you all the same, blah, 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 blah. And I took the tape and gave it to my daughter, Kirsten, and gave her all the other bits I have had of my mother and made a little reel, you know? And I gave it to my brother, and about six months later, around Christmas, I said to him, wasn't that great what my mom said, you know? And I started to quote it, and he said, she didn't say that. And I was like, she did. He's like, no. I said, what do you mean? He said, and he said, she said, and he had it word for word. Now, I may be crazy, and I may be, like, arrogant, and I am, but I was trying to make a movie for my brother. It, there could be two things. He could think I'm mad. He might just be saying that that's what my mother said, but he might have needed that. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that's what you're doing all the time when you're making movies. You're, you have the potential to it, not yet yeah, to change somebody's mind. They're so powerful. It was after 9-11, right? And 9-11 
happened when we were shooting on the set, you know? And I remember being out, you know, the next day and just, not the next day, but maybe a few days later, and we were at the border crossing and I saw the, they put the American flag in. So I took the camera, and I remember I very rarely take the camera. And, and I kept shooting the flag, but I kept putting it in and out of focus, you know? And I think, remember watching it later and thinking it was like a river. It was very, kind of like a painting, and that wouldn't be me. I'm not like that making movies, you know? But it seemed to me like a large percentage of the American population don't have a passport. So therefore, their way of getting to New York is they drive. They go, oh, that's how you get to New York, yeah? And then there's a border and they go, what's that? Oh, it must be Canada coming from, right? And then they see the flag or whatever and they see the kids and the kids are cute. And, there's, and then it's revealed that they're illegal aliens. So then the guard or border guard comes over and everybody knows you don't like those guys, right? Because they might let you in or not. And so it puts the audience on edge. Passports, please. We're on holidays! How are you, little girl? Yeah, and my dad's not working. And then you find out, oh, they've a dead child. And then the guard lets them in. And, and the mythology within the scene is the Irish got into America after death, the famine. That's sub in the subconscious of how the, Ameri of the America accepted the Irish. Okay, now, as a positive, that's a very, oh, we let them in, you know, that's great, it wasn't that good. So you feel good, feel positive. And when it gets to the dead child, they're thinking, this is manipulative. They're using the kids and the whole story, which it is. Of course, it's, everything's manipulative, every movie is. Well, the In America would address, I suppose, on a tangential way, all the things I'm saying kind of in a half-cocked intellectual way which is that just what is America and what is it currently and uh, how has it changed and what are borders and what are the borders between people and what's a family and the difficulty is writing the Irish family, believe it or not, because, you know, because when you come, you see all these different uh, families, you know, and um, so, they're almost like the observers, so it's hard to give them... Like, you know what happened in the original movie? In the original movie, every time I showed it at the previews, the audience would go, you know, well, in the top two boxes, you know that? You know, is it excellent or very good? And they'd go, very good. And, and the studio guys with, with desperation would say, well, what would make it excellent? <laughs> and they would not know, but consistently they said, you know, who do you like? Well, we love the mother, and we love the black man, and we love the kids, and we, the father. Mm. And I was like, that's me. <laughs> and I used to get up in front of them and say, why do you not like that guy, you know? <laughs> and a lesson in humility is easy to get, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they were like, oh, he's an idiot. He brings his kids to America, and he puts them in a junky house. And... He doesn't know what he's doing. And I was like, oh, oh. And then when that was said to me four or five times, it was the part he doesn't know what he wants that became preeminent, which is always what a structure for writing is. What does the main character want? Mm -hmm. And so I invented the most stupid thing on earth, which is that he wants to be a celebrity, a star, an actor. And they loved it. He could do that and... <laughs> He could put the kids in any junkie house he liked. <laughs> Here are your dad's some audition. Dad! What? What are you doing? I'm reading my scripts. Why? So I'm learning my lines. Oh, oh, he wants to be, he wants what we want, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the American dream, you know, whatever it, that dream is, that thing that keeps you hopeful mm -hmm. and so it's a combination of they just need something to put their coat on and they need a hope you know you've been watching a conversation with jim sheridan on on story mm -hmm.
OnStory is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's OnStory project, including the OnStory PBS series, now streaming online, the OnStory radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the OnStory book series available on Amazon. To find out more about OnStory and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.